How do you take care of yourself when you're the target of family scapegoating behaviors? That's the subscriber question I'll be answering in today's episode of Beyond Family Scapegoating Abuse, so stick around. Hey everyone, welcome to my channel. I'm Rebecca Mandeville, licensed psychotherapist, family systems and family scapegoat trauma expert and author of Rejected, Shamed and Blamed, Help and Hope for Adults in the Family Scapegoat Role. And today I will be addressing several questions I've had relating to when you're still in touch with family that is scapegoating you. And some people have very um, valid reasons for being in touch. They may be in a position where they can't break contact, at least right now. Others of you have been able to significantly limit or even end contact so you can gain traction with your mental and emotional health and your recovery from family scapegoating abuse. And I think you'll also find some of these um, things on my self-care checklist could be helpful to you as well, depending on where you are in your recovery journey. These 10 suggestions and recommendations are often what I'll initially invite my clients to explore and try out. Of course, there's way more than 10 things that one can do to help them recover from family scapegoating abuse and help them with self-care. And you're free to share what's helped you in the comments below this video. So let's start with step one. You'll first want to learn to recognize unsafe, triggering, harmful statements and people. And let me give you some um, examples of what might be a triggering or harmful statement. Such statements would include, you're too sensitive, I was only kidding, you take everything too seriously, I was only joking. Why are you getting so upset? You're so stubborn. You should just apologize. And that would be as an apologize to the person who abused you, meaning the abuse, the maltreatment you're experiencing is denied, ignored, invalidated, goes unacknowledged in your family system. Another statement might be, you can't cut ties with your family. You need to find a way to work it out. And that can feel very triggering. Um, how about this one? The real problem is that you won't forgive and forget. You need to get over it and move on. That would be also go along with your parents did the best that they could. Or if you don't have children, well, you don't have children, so you could never possibly understand. Here's another one. Don't tell anyone you're being abused by a family member. It might damage their reputation. It could hurt your family. And abuse is too strong a word anyway. Are you sure you didn't do something that caused your family to say these things about you or treat you this way? Ouch. And lastly, well, there's many more than this, but for the sake of this video, you need to tolerate your family's harmful behaviors and learn to let it roll off your back. They don't realize what they're doing, so don't take it so personally. Anyone who suggests or implies that you're too sensitive or overreacting when you attempt to tell them what's really happening to you in your family or that you need to toughen up and learn to tolerate mental and emotional maltreatment or plain abuse, this is not a person who can be supportive of your uh, recovering from what I named family scapegoating abuse during the course of my original family systems research when I explored this phenomenon in detail. So your recovery process will not be helped by trying to get support from people who say these things to you, whether they're, they're in or outside of your family. And such statements are in fact harmful and could even not only be triggering, but re-traumatize you. Step two on my my 10 step checklist is establish a support network of other adult survivors. 
There are several online forums for those who've experienced childhood abuse, who continue to experience abuse from their family today. These forms recognize complex trauma symptoms uh, typically, and these tend to work out well for adult survivors of family scapegoating. Um, out of the Storm is one that comes to mind. I often recommend them as a forum because they have some um, uh, in-depth understanding of complex trauma. There are several scapegoat support groups on Facebook that I'm aware of. I've posted on one here before that um, one in particular, it's, it's, it's an all-women's group, and I'll try to unearth that link and put that out there again in the community tab for you soon. You do need to remember, of course, with social media, the groups are often public, not always, sometimes they're private. So use caution when sharing sensitive events or information on uh, venues like Facebook or Twitter or Instagram or even here on YouTube. Step three, develop daily self-care practices. One of the reasons I made three free affirmation videos that I offer here on my channel's homepage, if you scroll down to the bottom of the page, you'll find them, uh, is that can be a wonderful way to start the morning and a great act of self-care to start to create new, healthier neural pathways and override uh, the neural pathways that might have formed around scapegoating behaviors that were being demonstrated towards you. Some people load them on their phones and listen to them through their earbuds. And uh, especially if they're in a highly stressful situation or family event, and they've told me later the, uh, that, that they found it very helpful. The fact is self-care usually goes out the window when one is suffering from any form of abuse, especially invisible abuse, such as family scapegoating abuse, because um, it's not acknowledged, recognized, validated in most cases. Checking out and dissociating are maladaptive survival responses that can leave you feeling disconnected and distant from your own body, thoughts, and feelings. And self-care can feel very challenging, but once you make it a daily practice, a daily habit, and prioritize your self-care of your body, mind, mind, spirit, you will start to feel more connected with yourself. And that can eventually lead you to feel more present in the moment and more able to act on your own behalf. If you find yourself in a situation where you're not being treated well, deciding to nurture yourself and attend to your body's needs is a critically important aspect of recovering uh, from this type of psycho-emotional abuse. And it's best to keep it simple at first. You can maybe start with a soothing cup of hot herbal tea. Chamomile is real nice. It has a calming effect. Um, I like the lavender misters, um, with the real essential oil, the lavender oil, scented candles, spa music, relaxing walks, uh, sitting uh, in nature when you can, or looking at birds and trees, Epsom salt baths. These are just a few of the daily practices you can experiment with as you begin to develop self-nurturing practices and habits. Step four is an important step. I do realize it's not possible for everyone depending on where you live and on your finances, but Finding a trauma-informed psychotherapist or trauma-informed um, coach can be invaluable when you're attempting to recover from family scapegoating abuse. And that is because, as I wrote in my book, most um, people who suffer from family scapegoating abuse have complex trauma symptoms. So trauma-informed care is an important aspect of recovering from FSA. I'm going to be posting an article that corresponds with this video and is a way for you to revisit this video through the written word. And I put a detailed um, suggestions into how to go about finding a therapist that may be able to help you who has family systems training in this article. So just 
visit my blog. I'll leave the link in the video description. Scroll down to step four. And that is a way that you may be able to find someone who has the right kind of training to be able to help you with family scapegoating abuse and complex trauma symptoms. Step five, release the need to figure out why you ended up in the scapegoat role in your family. Step five can be a challenging one. I have so many people that come to me who tell me they can't stop uh, ruminating, thinking over and over again of events that have happened between them and family members that were very hurtful or traumatizing. And they find themselves trying to figure out why they were the scapegoated family member. Why them? This is a real trap that most people who are scapegoated fall into. Why would my family do this to me is a question I hear often from new clients in my practice. There are many possible reasons that a particular family member might be scapegoated. It can definitely help to understand these dynamics. I've had many people tell me it's helped them very much to understand family systems, something that's not discussed too much these days uh, on social media. To understand family scapegoating abuse, you really have to understand family systems because it is, in the end, a family process that's going on. So rather than try to figure out what's going on in the heads of the people who are abusing you in your family, my suggestion is that you acknowledge that you did not get what all children really should get in their families, protection, love, support, nurturing, feeling cared about, being reflected positively, being encouraged. So while understanding why a family scapegoats one of their own is very helpful in regard to expanding your awareness and letting you have a bigger picture of how things like trauma might have impacted your family, intergenerational trauma, or if you had a personality disordered parent, how that might have impacted you and contributed to your being in that family scapegoat role. But in the end, I like to focus on radical acceptance with my clients, uh, radical acceptance and self-compassionate awareness, having to accept some very painful, hard truths and recognizing the harms done to you so that you can begin to heal. Step six, I have people sometimes ask me, should they go to family therapy with the family that's scapegoating them? And step six, I'm pretty clear and direct here, do not engage in family therapy until your family has stopped abusing you. And it's unlikely they're going to stop abusing you if they are unable to acknowledge any of the evidence, anything you've tried to share with them. If you've been shut down, invalidated, it's not going to be any different in a therapist's office, even with the best family therapist in the world. Because if they're sharing that uh, uh, folie au family, you know, that mad dance, believing this false narrative, what can happen is you go into that therapist's office and it's the family members uh, all against the scapegoat and the therapist may not have a clear idea of what's going on and it's like leading a lamb to slaughter and can be extremely re-traumatizing. And I've had this happen to clients before they found my work, before they started working with me and it was devastating for them. Remember, if your family's called you either to your face or behind your back crazy, a liar, a phony, et cetera, et cetera, trust me, given I am a family therapist, they'll have no problem doing it right there in the therapist's office, right in front of you. And I strongly encourage you to consider whether you want to put yourself through that. Step seven is about boundaries, your boundaries. I invite clients to examine their current boundaries 
in regard to their interactions and their current relationship status with scapegoating family members. If you're an adult survivor of FSA, you may have developed the trauma response of fawning, uh, also known as the fawn submit response. This can interfere with your ability to establish appropriate boundaries and protect yourself from abusive behaviors and people, including from your family members. Setting boundaries with family members can be particularly difficult, and I am sensitive to that. A good way to start that might feel uh, more doable, a, a more gentle way to start, uh, well, first of all, don't shame yourself if you don't have good boundaries, because there's a reason for that. You were more than likely taught that bad things could happen to you if you tried to have boundaries. And remember that fond submit response may be what allowed you to psycho-emotionally and spiritually, sometimes even physically, survive in your family of origin. So again, we want to have an attitude of self-compassion. But some questions you can ask yourself are, would I put up with this behavior if I weren't related to this person? That's an important question to ask, isn't it? If the answer is no, then you may need to work on establishing healthy boundaries with everyone in your life, including your family. Remember, you need not ever tolerate abusive, disrespectful behavior ever from anyone. And this is why sometimes you'll find that you have no choice but to go no contact or severely limit contact with scapegoating family members because when you do start to get healthier and stronger and you do start to set boundaries, the you know what starts with an S, ends with a T, hits the fan. In fact, the scapegoating behaviors can amp up and it can get much, much worse. And I always prepare my clients for that if they are still in contact and let them know they may find that they are going to have to quickly end contact the minute they start setting boundaries because it's often not well tolerated, to say the least, in these types of dysfunctional or narcissistic family systems. Step eight, you've heard me say the word self-compassion more than once already in this video. And step eight is commit to developing self-compassion and self-love. If you're an adult survivor of FSA, you may unknowingly be swimming in a sea of toxic shame, which can interfere with your ability to protect yourself from abuse so you can heal. And in my book, Rejected, Shamed, and Blamed, I do have a chapter on toxic shame. It's very important you're aware of this. This is unconsciously held shame. It's different than ordinary shame. And you're particularly likely to be carrying a load of toxic shame unconsciously if the scapegoating you experienced happened from a very young age. The antidote to toxic shame is developing self-compassion and self-love. And in the article that goes along with this video, I have linked you to an article from the Positive Psychology website, which provides some excellent information and resources to help you learn to have self-compassion and start to really love yourself. Step nine, you won't be surprised by this limit or end contact with family who persist in their scapegoating behaviors. Family scapegoating is a form of abuse. I don't care if it's widely recognized. I don't care if there's social validation. I have been working in this field for over 20 years, and I can tell you this qualifies as psycho-emotional abuse. In regard to limiting or ending contact, I realize for many of you watching me right now, this is not an easy decision, but in the end, abuse is abuse. If someone in your family is unable to treat you with kindness, care, respect, 
common courtesy if they have a false narrative about you that they're so tightly tied to they can't tolerate hearing your side of things at all or if you try to share it you're not believed you're dismissed as crazy or a liar you need to ask yourself why you are putting up with this behavior how is this impacting you how is this impacting the good relationships in your life the people who care about you no one exists in isolation and usually your being scapegoated is going to impact more than just you but also the people who care about you who truly care about you and that you care about in return And lastly, step 10, take the time to learn what you're trying to recover from. That's probably already happening because here you are watching me today. So I applaud you for that. The fact is family scapegoating is a form of psycho-emotional abuse that is poorly understood, under-researched. Uh, society doesn't like to think that Parents or siblings could abuse their own family member, bully them, uh, systemically attack them. Um, it's not even understood well by the mental health profession. Again, this is exactly why I have been researching on this phenomenon for over 20 years. It's why I wrote my introductory guide on FSA, Rejected, Shamed, and Blame. And if you have questions, want to know more, I do encourage you to take a look at my book. I hope you found these 10 steps from my self-care checklist for adult survivors of family scapegoating abuse helpful. And as always, I'd love to hear from you in the comments. I'm commenting only the first week after a new video is released due to the volume of comments that I get now. And I welcome all of our new subscribers. I'll see you next week. Take care.